it. Yeah. It's got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the number of steps required to move uh, VR. And each one of these steps is going to take a time dt. Number here sees the speed of light. So the photons, when they're not interacting, they're just traveling at the speed of light. So the excess energy energy density is gonna be R square ER DT. So the volume of this thing times the difference between these two, so DE. So the luminosity is going to be about. divided by the time. So Is that a D epsilon or a D time? This one? Yeah. Epsilon. Okay. So he's... Hmm. We can select one of these DRs with this one. The C will move it up here. And then we get our D, E, E, R. So this is how the energy density changes as a function of the radius. And we're very close to being done with these equations. So if you want to actually do the integral, which I didn't want to do, you get a, an, an extra factor of one third when you have uh, the cosine theta each time that you have the uh, square. Each time that you're moving in one direction, you only want to see the perpendicular one. So to make this exact, you need to add a three. Okay, so this 
Sul di luminosity. You gotta buy that area. You end up with that. Have you seen an equation like this before? You see that this is just, or well, it is for a particular star. It's just a, some constant. Have you seen an equation like that before? That's the diffusion. So this will be the diffusion coefficient. And this is called um, well, the diffusion equation for stars. So what happens if your this kappa, now I can call it, um, I'm going to call it opacity. And it includes um, mostly the absorption, but can uh, include a little bit of the scattering terms also. This is the, the total thing. So what happens if the opacity is uh, really big? What happens to the luminosity? Hmm? Goes down. So if you are very opaque, you don't emit a lot of light. If the opacity is uh, small, then the luminosity is high. So this equation tells you how much the photons struggle to get out of wherever they are in the star. So what will the opacity depend on? for a particular star. Yep. So most stars are going to be um, mostly hydrogen. Uh, you have some other ones which you have a small amount of other um, materials. Astronomers for some reason call everything a metal everything that is not hydrogen or helium. So uh, depending on how opaque it is, you can um, get an idea of the luminosity or the other way around. So you can start building models uh, with this. So the other one that you need, oh, I need to do something else before. This is going to be pretty cool. So we talked about how we are not perfect uh, black bodies, but if you look at our um, spectrum does look like the spectrum of a black body. So the energy density is going to be this A or sigma. So what is A? called the Stefan Boltzmann coefficient. Sorry, I'm not going to memorize that.
bring good memories. <laughs> All right. So, um, DE, DR is DE, DT, DT, DR. So this one we can get, so it's going to be So then the EDR, now in terms of the temperature, as I promised last time, is um, 4A GQ DT, which is a function of R, DR. So now we can write. equation so the derivative of the temperature with respect to the radius uh, 3 rho and now everything is a function um, of the radius we're looking in only one direction the radial direction T is a function of the radius. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of this one so that it's more clear. This one is equation 1.2.30, um, equation of radiative transfer. So how many equations do we have so far? dt, which is function of the radius, dr, before we derive dp, dr, we also derive, well this, this is just conservation of mass, dm, dr, and you can get conservation of energy,
it's the same equation that you had for the mass. So then now we have um, energy density instead of mass. So all of these equations are functions of the radius. The boundary conditions that you had are mass, zero is zero. The luminosity at zero is going to be zero also. And then the pressure at the end of your sphere is zero. And the mass at the end is the total mass. So these are the four equations that describe um, all stars. So for a particular, let's say that you start looking at a bunch of stars that uh, were born from the same um, cloud. So their chemical composition is going to be the same. Then um, the opacity is going to be the same for all of them. The pressure um, as a function the radius is going to be the same. The um, nuclear energy generation is also going to be the same. That depends on you know, what materials you have to fuse. And so everything is a function of the radius in these equations. Um, but everything depends on everything else. So you can rewrite all of them. I'm not going to do it uh, here, but uh, it's a function of the mass. And that is useful because the mass is the only thing that makes the stars different. So the whole, well, except for you know collisions with other stars and things like that, um, the whole life is, uh, of a star is predicted um, by these equations and it's going to depend only on the mass. Which is kind of cool, no surprises. So when they reach the, um, the end of their main sequence life, so, you know, because everything depends on everything else, you might have seen the HR diagram. Oops. What? Russell? I don't know if I spelled this one correctly. So for this HR diagram, what do you have um, typically the x-axis and y-axis? Make sure you have the mass over here and the temperature. And then you see your, it's going to look kind of like that. And all the stars that are main sequence fall along this line. And that is because they are described by the same physics. So depending on uh, the initial mass also, 
the end, so after they move out of the main sequence, it's going to be different. So if they're massive enough, you know, they become um, supernovas, then they can create a neutron star or a black hole. Uh, if they're kind of middle mass like the sun, they're going to create a cloud. They're going to get rid of their um, excess mass and they're going to become white dwarfs. And the ones that are very low mass, uh, they live for like trillions of years, the um, red dwarfs. And eventually become um, white dwarfs as well. So, but after they move up, move out of the main sequence, their mass is going to change. So then they are described by the same model, but um, it's, a, it's a different uh, fate then. OK, um, what else? Yep, I think that's, that's all I have. So questions, comments? So quiet. <laughs> jokes are fine. You remember the jokes? No, I don't. I literally, like, as soon as you said comment, they blanked out of my head. Oh, I think one of them was, uh, that my location from you, 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 um, sheets of paper you know, with the same symbol. I, I, I have done the whole sheet of paper, but you know, sometimes I'm like, okay, this is really the reality. Yep. It's difficult to write on the board. Yeah, I can make the transition from paper to board. I'm really But yeah, I mean, learning Greek is always good. Classifications in astronomy don't make any sense. Like, I don't know why they don't start from A, why they have to start with O, why they call everything a metal, and things like that. So, I find it hard to you know, memorize things that don't make sense. My sentence. Hmm? My sentence. Yes, it does. But I don't think that was the reason that. Why you know, they they used to like they start with O. So the sun is like a G star or something. Yeah, the sun. So when I was growing up, um, I remember you know, reading very often that the sun was a an average or normal star. But it's not that. I mean, this is it's definitely not rare. But most uh, stars are red dwarfs. Oh, class M. Class M, yeah. So the sun is not the most common kind of star. So I guess that might have implications for life. You know, if you have trillions of years to go around your star. And then there's a problem, for example, with um, with Proxima B, like that exoplanet. 
Mm-hmm. So it's in the it's in the Goldilocks song song for it might have liquid water if it has an atmosphere. It might, it might not have an atmosphere because it's so close to. Oh, it's Goldilocks. Yes, that too. That seems to be the um, you know, if, if you let things go for long enough, everything gets steadily locked. So. I guess eventually the Earth and the Moon are gonna. Well, the Moon is the Earth. Still, is not to to the to the Moon. So, like, if you look at Pluto and Chiron, uh, they are they're always facing the um, at each other in the same way. They don't rotate with respect to each other. So, I guess. Uh, we are giving um, angular momentum to the moon. Hmm? Yes, yeah, so the moon has to move farther away in order to conserve angular momentum. And so at some point you're going to be pretty far away and tidally launch. We only have like another one billion years really on this planet. Hmm? Mm. So that might be an issue, you know, like the the yes. day might become too long. With the yeah, the, the rotation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we only have like another 300 million years of approaches. Yeah, it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many things happening before. <laughs> <laughs> we have like 100 years of Well, <laughs> but you have to put things in perspective regarding climate change. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's changing, it's pretty bad for us, but it doesn't mean that life is going to disappear. It's just going to be crappy for us. And we're in a, we are in a glacial age, is that right? I get confused with, with these ages. So there's like the mini ones and then there's the longer ones. So the, the longer one, we are in a, in a cold uh, epoch. So at some point, you know, like, we're not going to be around probably, but it's just going to change because of its position with the sun. <laughs> Unintended consequences, I don't know. It'll be pretty scary. All right, guys, sounds good.